Good morning, everyone. Before I start, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background in gardening, and then we'll get started. As a child, my dad and I had a garden in our backyard, my family, and there was nothing like picking fresh vegetables and having them for supper that day. It was a lot of work. You had a water, you had a weed, had it pick the tomato bugs off of your plants, but at the end of the year, you reaped the rewards of your hard work. So today, I'm going to give you some practices that might help you be a more successful gardener. I'm still learning. I live in Leroy Township, and the first couple years I planted out there, I have clay soil and it hasn't, wasn't very successful. And I learned what plants would do well, where not to plant, how to protect my plants from rodents and insects. And I learned off of my successes. So today, some of the practices I share with you, hopefully will get you going. IPT, what is IPT? Is it a new stock symbol? Is it a new texting term? It's integrated pest management. And what it is, it's a multi-step approach for ways to fight against pests and other things that will decre decrease your results. So some of the things we're looking at are selecting the correct plants. We're in a zone five, I believe. Six, okay. So we don't want plants that are in zone three and try and grow them there and expect to do well because we have a shorter growing season. Look at cultural practices. Things that we do planting our gardens that will help us. Establishing thresholds. What amount of pests are acceptable in a garden. Inspection and monitoring. That's very important because you don't know what is eating your plants if you don't inspect in applying controls. So plant selection. You want to select disease and pest resistant plants to help you alleviate your problems. Plants that will be successful in the area. Growers are constantly developing seeds that are more resistant to some of the common pests. Choose vigorous growing plants in correct growing conditions. Why do you want vigorous growing plants? Well, if you have a plant that grows fast versus a plant that grows slow, less chance the insects are going to chew up that plant because it's going to be big and healthy before they have a chance to decimate the health of that plant. Cultural practices. Take into consideration things like watering, crop rotation. There's farms out by me. They don't plant corn every year because corn is very taxing on the soil. It takes a lot of nitrogen out of the soil. So, farmers do research and they rotate their crops. You shouldn't plant the same thing in the same location every year. Soil aeration and mulching. Those are some things that you could do like I did with my soil. Amend the soil or have a raised garden bed because my soil is clay. It's not very healthy for growing plants. So I have to amend that, mulch, that so soil with mulch and till it, and then I use disease and pest resistant plants. We mentioned the vigorous growing plants and the gr correct growing season. Look at the plants that you're growing, and when you get a seed packet, it'll tell you the number of days to maturity on the plant. 
if there's a variety of tomatoes that will vary from maybe 55 days to 75 days. We have a sh shorter growing season, so if you're choosing a 75 maturity day plant, you don't want to plant, plant that late in the season because you may not get a crop. So keep that in mind. Establishing thresholds. Think about the amount of damage that can be tolerated. You want to look at your pest population and the plant's stage of development. Look at how healthy a plant is. Sometimes if a, hel a healthy plant is among, or an unhealthy plant is among other plants, it might be wise to pull that unhealthy plant out so that disease doesn't spread to the other plants. Keep that in mind. And look at the life cycle and habits of, the, of a pest. Inspection and monitoring. Inspect the plant's environment for clues. Okay. How many of you have had Japanese beetles in your yard? It's not a pretty sight when a Japanese beetle gets a hold of your plant and one day you go out there and your leaves look like lace. So you know there's some sort of pest on your plant. Look underneath the leaves. You could set traps to monitor what types of pests are present. And applying controls. Select the most efficient and appropriate option. Controls at the right time. So insects have a life cycle. They start with eggs. Next life cycle is larvae. Then pupa, that's when they're in a cocoon. And then when they're an adult. When you put out pesticides, you don't want to do it when they're in a the cocoon because that's like an armor plate around them. It's not going to do much good. And when they're adults, it's pretty much too late. You want to try and get them in the early stage right here. Larva is when they are most susceptible, early on. And it's critical to control the deaths the past before they reproduce and increase in population. So that's why you want to go out there and monitor. Diseases are more difficult to control. Diseases would be a, a branch that's turning color. When you see a disease on a branch, remove that. Do, you, do any of you mulch? How many of you mulch? Okay. If you are mulching, and you're taking off a disease portion of a plant, you don't want to put that disease portion into your mulch pile because what's going to happen is you're going to introduce that disease into your mulch. And then when you put it back in your garden bed, you're going to spread that disease. Plant selection. We're talking about types of disease resistant plants. Now, you could do research. I just pulled up some different varieties. These are plants that will help, that are disease resistant, and they're bred for being more successful. So, tomatoes, Iron Lady, Stellar, Brandy Wise, Summer Sweetheart, Plum Perfect. If you don't see these in the store, you can look online at the seed catalog. You can look up a variety of a tomato, tomato or a green bean, or a cucumber, and these are varieties that are resistant to diseases. So you could do, do your, you pick your plants that will be successful before you even plant. And that's from, again, Cornell University, College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Cultural practices, irrigation, improving the soil aeration and drainage. Do not water late at night. Reason being, you put that water on the plants and there's a possibility you're opening up an opportunity for bacteria to grow. 
If you have pots and garden tools, use a mixture of one part bleach to nine parts water. You should dump your soil out of your pots every year, put in fresh soil, clean the pots out with that bleach water mixture. So if there's any kind of disease in there or on your tools, you're not introducing it into next year's crop. That's a cultural practice. Crop rotation. Three-year crop rotation is the minimum. That's probably more for agricultural, but you should probably look, if you're having not much success with some of your plants, you should look at possibly not putting in the tomatoes or the beans or the cucumbers where you're planting them for the last three years. You might want to change out that location. Mulching, I already mentioned that. Do not mix diseased plant matter in the mulch pile. Put it somewhere else, in the garbage, in the woods. And uh, we talk, just talked about the, the hygiene. Clean your tools and pot, pots with one part bleach to nine parts water. This, that includes shovels, your rakes. Clean them off because you never know what kind of bacteria that you can't see is on there and you might introduce it into your crop. Thresholds. Okay, this is part of your inspection. If you have a few holes on a collar leaf, that doesn't really need control. If you have the entire leaf is, is eaten, the crop is destroyed. So it's a fine line. That's why you want to do your inspection. If there's a couple holes, you want to call out a crop duster and crop dust your, your garden. Uh, you have to take into account how much damage is done. What is acceptable? What's the threshold? Less than 12 grub worms in a square foot of turf grass, it's acceptable as long as the lawn is growing vigorously. If that in density increases, action should be taken. Colorado potato beetles, they could devastate a potato crop early in the season. Late in the season, they can eat all the foliage and there's little damage to the crop. So it's also be aware of when that insect is active. There's a, thing, a term called phenology. And phenology is looking at when insects hatch, when they are going to be active, and that's when you need to be aware are they in your garden. Inspection includes checking the underside of the leaves, not just the, uh, the top. Look at the buds, new growth, and even the root systems in, in stream cases if you see that damage. It's not just a quick walkthrough. Lift up the leaves because sometimes those insects are underneath the leaves. You should do a regular inspection and it allows you to identify what problems are there before there's major, major damage. C controls are more effective if the problem is caught early. I showed you that life cycle of the insects. When do you want to get them? In the egg and the larva stage, not in a pupa or adult stage. You want to get them early in their life cycle. You want to get them right after they hatch before they can reproduce. Inspection and monitoring. There's different types of traps you could use. There's a color sticky trap. There's colors are attract insects and they design the traps to attract certain insects and they're sticky traps. When they land on them, they can't get, fly off. Pheromone trap. Those are the traps 
that everyone puts in their yard for Japanese beetles. Now, what, what a pheromone trap does is it releases a scent that attracts the opposite sex of the insect. And in the case of the pheromone trap, it attracts the male Japanese beetles. One of our instructors in our class said, if you want to get a Japanese beetle trap, don't put it in your yard, put it in your neighbor's yard because you're going to, you're going to attract all the Japanese beetles from the neighborhood. So keep that in mind. Probably the best way to combat Japanese beetles is not with a pheromone trap. You get a little saucer of soapy water and go out there. It's, it's, it's a little more work, but go out there and hand pick them off of the plant and put them in the soapy water. And that soapy water blocks up their airways so they can't get loose. Pitfall trap. I'm sorry, I, I didn't look up what that one is, but I think what that is, is that the, the pitfall trap, the insect goes in and it can't get out. And then the light trap. The light trap are, is those UV lights that attracts the, the bugs and they, they make a lot of noise if there's a lot of bugs in your yard. Way to apply controls. We want to get them at their vulnerable time in certain stages of the life. Eggs can be controlled with oil sprays. What the oil spray does is it gets on the oil, on, on the eggs, and basically suffocates what, what's in there. Larva stages is the next stage for insect life cycle, and they're vulnerable in that stage of their life. If there's a heavy rain, you have to reapply. So keep that in mind. Look at the weather report when you're using their controls. And also, when you're using insecticides, don't just go out there and hog wild and just spray and everything because there's good bugs and there's bad bugs. You want to keep your good bugs that will take care of the bad bugs. So use your insecticides sparingly. Diseases, those are more difficult to control. Uh, if you have fruit trees, now is about the time to start spraying uh, your fruit trees. I have three apple trees in my yard and you have to spray them often because you'll get worms and you'll get spots on the apples. So keep that in mind and then if it rains, you have to reapply. Larger insects like your Japanese beetles, we talked about how we could remove them by hand, put them in the soapy water. Read the product labels for the pesticides and the fungicides so you know how to use them. In the case of pesticides and fungicides, more is not better. Know how long the pesticide remains in effect. Observe the time lapse between the last application and the harvest on food crops. Some pesticides you don't want to apply just before harvest. So educate yourself what you could put down on your plants. Botanical pesticides can be applied to food crops closer to harvest. Those are more natural. Place larger hand remove pests in soap and water. Those are the Japanese beetles we talked about. Fungicides, they prevent infections in plants and help those infections from spreading. And then if you see a branch that's turning color, prune that branch off and put it somewhere other than your mulch pile. That way you're not introducing that into your mulch. Keep the following in mind when you inspect your plants, entire environment for Q. Keep records of your findings. That is the best way to be more successful at IPM. Be diligent throughout the year. 
build on your successes, educate yourself. You know, we talked about rotating your, your crops, selecting the right crops, finding out when the pests are active, how to combat them. Aphids on tomato plants. You really don't need a pesticide for that. You could turn your hose on a fine spray and spray them on the tomato plant and remove those off your plant. And those are really small, you can hardly see them. But when you get a small, a fine spray from your hose that will remove them. Abraham Lincoln once said, we can complain about rose bushes having thorns or rejoice because of thorn bushes have roses. I hope you can rejoice from your successes in your gardens. I hope you have learned a few ways to be more successful in your growing season. And at this time, I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Lake County Ohio State Extension Office and the Master Gardener Volunteer Program. Thank you. I appreciate it.